just before I begin uh, our talk today, uh, just a couple of quick things I wanted to mention. Actually, believe it or not, 19 years ago today was my very first Sunday as pastor of Calvary Assembly. And yeah. I know, it's hard to believe because I look so young, right? <laughs> and um, uh, we came to a church family that had less than 20 people. There are more people serving on the worship team now than was in the church at the time. And uh, that never gets old to me. God's been incredibly generous with our church family. And we are very grateful for that. And he's brought us some of the very best people in our community. And we've never thought for a single moment that we're the only church in our community. God has blessed uh, the Chai Lai area and the greater Rochester area with some amazing spiritual shepherds. They are faithful, they are dedicated, they are knowledgeable. Uh, they, they faithfully serve uh, in the assignments that God has given them, and we are so grateful for that. And we don't think that uh, we're the only church. There are lots of uh, uh, wonderful faith communities who are doing amazing things. And we just consider it a privilege to be one among them. And so uh, we're, we're very glad for what God has done to this point and what he will continue to do. How many have a suspicion God's not done with us yet? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, one more thing. How many would rather feel welcome than unwelcome? Let's just check. Some of your hands are not up, and I don't know what to say about that. We'll, we'll try to mistreat you on the way out. No, we won't do that. Uh, but... Uh, there are some things that we can do. Hospitality is one of our super values. We think anybody who comes in here ought to feel welcome. And there are some things that we can do to assist that. Has anybody here ever been to a concert? Yeah. Where's the best seats in the concert? In the front. Does anybody know where the best seats in the church are? In the back. <laughs> it's true. I don't know why. I brush my teeth and everything. It doesn't seem to matter. Uh, but here's what we'd like you to do. Uh, we have really stretched our capacities uh, on uh, especially the 930 service. And so when you come in, if you can do two things, it will help us a lot. If you can move up and you can move in. It helps people feel welcome when they come into the room and there's a seat that's readily available to them. And if we can um, uh, reserve uh, seats more to the back for uh, mothers with infants and with uh, uh, people who come in uh, later. It's, it, people can feel very uncomfortable if they come in late and they have to walk down to the front to find a seat. So if you could help us with that, it'll make people feel very welcome, and that means a lot to us. All right, we're continuing on in our series called Honest to God, and we're talking about prayer. Uh, if I were to ask you what are the necessities of life, uh, what are the absolute essentials in order to survive, you would tell me things like uh, air, Water, food, and shelter. How many know you would not last long outside today without uh, shelter? But if I were to ask you what are the absolute necessities of spiritual life, what would you respond with? And the truth is it's, it's not a long list. The absolute essentials are things like scripture and prayer and community and generosity. What I would want you to know today, and our focus for most of the month of January, is on prayer. Prayer is one of the most essential elements to spiritual life because it is the primary way we experience God and deepen our relationship with him. And it is one of the most effective ways that we actually experience the transformation and growth that God desires for us. So the challenge is, is that prayer does not come easily to us. Prayer is not easy for me. Prayer is difficult for me, and I can tell you why. Uh, my mind can wander when I try to pray. Does that happen to anybody else besides me? Or my schedule is really full, and trying to find time to pray is challenging. And then sometimes I feel like I'm just repeating myself. Like I wonder if God gets as bored hearing me as I get saying certain things. So we just kind of repeat prayers over and over. And then a lot of times in prayer, I don't feel like anything is happening. I'm just talking and I hope this is working. There's a reason for this, and that is that prayer is actually not a natural exercise to us. 
We're raised in a culture that teaches us to be independent. It calls us to be self-sufficient. We want to be able to act on our own. We don't want to be, have to rely on anyone. And there is nothing that does more of a blow to our pride of self-sufficiency than the act of prayer. Because we're going to God and asking him for help in things that we know we don't have sufficient resources to be able to handle. And uh, life can go pretty well for us, but it's like I tell people, everything's fine until something goes wrong. Things can fall apart pretty quickly. All you have to do is run into a financial challenge where it looks like you might not be able to get out of the month and meet your obligations. Or maybe you're talking to a doctor and he gives you a diagnosis that indicates, at least for a season of your life, there's going to be some significant limitations or maybe even a shortening of your life. Sometimes we'll see something in a, a child or in a spouse that terrifies us because we know what the long-term trajectory of that kind of behavior can do to a person. Or maybe we just see something that shakes confidence in ourselves or in someone else. And in those moments, what I can tell you is, is that there is a, a sense of urgency to pray. And while it is not a natural exercise, I think every person on the planet at some point in their life have looked to the heavens and hoped that someone would be able to hear them and help them. What I want you to know is that there are some things that are only to be used for emergency, but prayer is not one of them. How many have ever seen a sign like this? Emergency exit only. Alarm will sound. Has anybody ever walked through one of those doors? Has anybody ever just pushed it open to see if the alarm would actually... Yeah, I, okay, there's a few of you in here. I know who you are. And, and then this one. Fire, break glass, pull the handle. We have them all throughout the building. We don't want you doing that unless there's a fire. I don't want you to stand at one of our fire alarms and go, I wonder if this works. I wonder what happens if I pull it. Please don't do that. Or, or how about this? 911. How many before you left the house this morning dialed 911 to get an update on the weather? We wouldn't do that. 911 is not for weather. That's not what we would do. Uh, we would not call 911 and they says, yes, can I help you? What is your emergency? Oh, no emergency. I just wanted to have a conversation today. They would tell you, you need to get off the phone. This is reserved for people having emergencies. And a lot of times we approach our concepts of prayer as though it is for emergency only. This is what I want you to know. The Bible reveals that prayer is not just for emergencies only. And in fact, there are benefits to prayer that have nothing to do with emergency. In regular, habitual prayer, you can experience things like the presence of God you can experience things like the peace of God. You can experience things like the purpose of God. And these are not woven around or integrated into emergencies. Rather, they are something that flows through the relationship and the life that God intends for us to experience. The Bible reveals that this prayer can have that kind of profound effect on us. But I have observed there are three basic prayer killers in our lives, and I would like us to identify them, and then I'm going to show you a way to neutralize them in your life. And the first prayer killer is hurry. Hurry. We have to be in a hurry. We feel like we have to move more quickly. We need to be more efficient. We feel like we're behind schedule. We have a sense of urgency, and that always creates a little bit of stress. Uh, my daughter, for Christmas, got one of those, those uh, things that you wear on your wrist that monitors your heart and your calories and your steps and all those. Does anybody else have one of those? Yeah, and she just, she called and talked to my wife last night and she said, I have substantiated with this thing on my wrist how stressful grocery shopping actually is to me. Like, it shows, it shows, this is not good. So here's the thing, Some, you might think, well, I'm not, I don't, I don't think this is a real issue in my life. So here's a test. Uh, you don't have to answer out loud. You don't have to write anything down. But just uh, think in your mind, yes or no. Some, these are yes or no questions. First question, do you often feel like there are not enough hours in the day? Yes or no? Second question, do you feel unproductive if you are not multitasking? Yes or no? Third question, 
Do you feel you are missing important moments in the lives of those you love? Yes or no? Okay. Fourth question. Do you consistently underestimate the amount of time it will take to do something? Yes or no? Number five. Do you tend to procrastinate until you are up against a deadline or in a crisis? Yes or no? And then lastly, do you find yourself becoming more impatient with yourself and with others? So let's just check. How many said yes to at least one of those things? I'm not going to ask how many said yes to all of those things. But here's the thing. If you said yes to even one of those things, you have been contaminated with hurry sickness. And you are contagious. So just, you need to tell the person right now, just poke them and say, I'm contagious. Just tell them, I'm contagious. It's hurry sickness. Now let me ask you a question. As hurried up as we are, let's suppose in the first service this morning, someone came up to me and they said, uh, I'm an independently wealthy person, and I would like to bless some people in the Calvary Assembly family. So I would like to provide a break for people in their lives. So anyone who would desire to have a break, it can either be a three-day break or a seven-day break, and it will include first-class air transportation to a tropical island of five-star hospitality, all meals included. It will cost them nothing. All of the expenses are paid. They can choose three days or seven days. All right, just ask the person next to you, which one would you choose? Three days or seven days? What do you think? I think most of us would go on the seven day and we might even ask, can we add a three day to a seven day and turn it into a 10 day? And what I want you to know is that there is a kind of break that has already been paid for for us. And it is a prayer break. And this is what I want you to see. Jesus talked about this. He said, come to me. What's the next word? Uh, you have to realize how recklessly generous Jesus is and who he allows to come to him. No one's excluded. All. You who are, what's the next word? Weary and what? Burdened. This is so critical because he's not saying when you build up the energy and you can appropriately present yourself and you have a su sufficient attention span, then you are eligible. That's not what he says. This is who's eligible. If you're weary and if you're burdened, you are welcome. And I will give you what? When was the last time you thought of prayer as rest? He goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Prayer is a way to take a break. There are lots of people who see prayer as a religious obligation, as a burden that has been imposed on them, but please understand this. Jesus did not come to put burdens on you. He came to lift burdens from you. That's why he came. So what he's telling us is, is that this interaction with him can be like a little mini vacation. It can be a little spa for your soul. It can be a way to recharge your inner world when it has been drained by your outer life. He says, come all who are weary or burdened. He does not say that if you are tired, you are disqualified. And he doesn't scold us for being tired. You just need to manage your life better. He doesn't do that. He says, come and I will give you rest. And then this is what's astonishing to me. It says that he will be gentle and he will be humble. The God of the universe is gentle and he is humble. If God is humble, how many think the rest of us probably should be? 
you know. And this is really good news. You don't have to travel to some significant religious location. You don't have to go through a long litany of religious ritual. You just need to take a break. And in those moments, sometimes Jesus will actually teach us. We can learn from him. He'll give us insight into how to better approach a situation that we're trying to work through. Or maybe he'll give us a strategy on, on how to handle a significant responsibility. Or, or he'll say something like, have you ever thought about doing it this way? And that, that, that thought will just kind of interrupt the thoughts that we have been thinking. So here's the question. How can you take a prayer break like this? And the first is focus on the love of God. When you are hurried, we don't focus on love. When we're hurried, we focus on all kinds of things. The things we have to do, the things we've left undone, we focus on things that other people haven't done that they were supposed to. But if you can just take a little break and focus on a God who loves you so much that even his son was not too much for him to give to you. It's astonishing. And then focus on the gifts of God. He has been so gracious. It is so easy to focus on the things we still want. But couldn't we also focus on the things he's already given? I mean, he's given us his grace, and he's given us his son, and he's given us life, but he's also given us health. He's given us family. He's given us friends. He's given us provision. He's given us so very much, and it's easy to not pay attention to any of those things until something goes wrong. So just take a moment and just kind of focus. You can just kind of tell, tell yourself and tell God, I'm so grateful that you are a God who loves me more than I could have imagined, and you have given so much to me, more than I can even calculate. And then just simply say, thank you. Thank you. It is astonishing what that recalibration of your heart does. It does something inside of us. When we notice that God loves us, and we notice the gifts he's given to us, and we say thank you, it's like a little mini vacation. And this is the result. You feel rested. You feel rested. Most of what burns us out is not what we do. It's what we don't do. We don't take these little breaks. We don't take these little mini vacations where we just acknowledge the goodness and the graciousness of God. Here's the second prayer killer. Worry. Worry. Here's what Dale Carnegie said. If you can't sleep, then get up and do something instead of just lying there worrying. It's the worry that gets you, not the lack of sleep. Or Dean Smith, famous coach, says this, if you treat every situation as a life and death matter, you will die a lot of times. Is that not true? Or Corey Ten Boom, who was a Holocaust survivor, she said, any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. Isn't that wise? See, the truth is, we all worry. Maybe about different things, but we all do. And worry is a thief. It will steal your sleep. It will steal your strength. It will steal your health. It will steal your relationships. It will steal your resources. And here's the terrifying thing. You can worry about anything. You can. I mean, you, you want something to worry about today in case you think you don't have enough to worry about? Go back and find your high school yearbook and pull out the picture of yourself and hold it up next to you in the mirror. I had somebody, I, came, I ran into them the other day and they told me, and said, you have not changed in 19 years. I said, you need to go to your optometrist. I've seen that picture, and there have been changes, and those changes have not been for the better. We can worry about anything. We can worry about our health. We can worry about our looks. We can worry about money. We can worry about relationships and friendships and children and parents and jobs and school. We can worry about anything. My sister used to tell me, worry works. I said, how do you figure that? She says, almost everything I worry about doesn't happen, so it must be working. I said, that's not quite how it works. And we don't just worry about the things that will happen. We worry about the things that could happen. We combine fear with imagination, and you get worry. And this is what the Bible says. It's really remarkable. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, it says, Do not be anxious about, what's the next word? 
So, like, we already feel bad, but I'm so glad there's a comma there and not a period. But, why did he put a but in there? Because he knows we worry. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, some people think that real spiritual maturity means you are never afraid. But that's not what it is. The command of Scripture is not don't act afraid. The command of Scripture does not say don't vocalize your fears. Some just try to think more positive thoughts, or some try to at least not say something negative. But this passage doesn't call for that. This passage says that as long as you worry, you have something to pray about. Just think about that. You can convert any worry into a prayer. It doesn't just have to keep plugging your mind and draining your soul. You can transform it into a conversation with God. Now, does anybody else, I know there are some people that just automatically wake up at the time they're supposed to in the day, but uh, how many uh, here need an alarm? I do, and I'm often surprised when it goes off in the morning, you know, and, uh, and I shut it off for years. Some of you know this. I used to keep my alarm in the, in the closet, so when it went off, I'd actually have to get out of bed to go shut it off, and somewhere along the way, I'd wake up, because it was easy for me just to hit the snooze uh, or shut it off and go back to sleep, and so I'll, I'll shut it off, and then I start walking across the room, and on the way, I'm trying to figure out what day is it, and, and what do I have to do? And we have these alarms that we use. And here's what I want you to know. You can treat your worries like a prayer alarm. Anytime you worry, you can just immediately convert that into a prayer. And some, some people have never learned how to do that. And so they carry all these burdens. Now, here's what I want you to know. Uh, how do we do that? First of all, just ask God for what you need. That's what he said, right? Don't worry about anything, but... In everything. And then he talks about our asking God for what we need. Now, asking God for what we need comes in two forms. And the first has to do with prevention. There's just some things we don't want to have happen in our lives. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to run out of money. We don't want to lose our jobs. We don't want to lose our marriage. We don't want our children to go in directions that they shouldn't. There's lots of things we don't want, so we ask for prevention of those things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with prevention prayers. It's appropriate to ask God for that. But if all we ask for is prevention prayers then when we get sick or when our children are not doing well or when we're struggling financially, then we tend to be even more anxious because we think God has not heard us. So along with our prevention prayers, we need to pray provision prayers. Provision prayers. So if I have to go through a significant challenge in life and carry a burden, what I need is strength. If God will not, please understand this, if God will not remove the burden, God will give you the strength. If, if he does not give you immediate healing, he can give you peace in the midst of that physical storm. If you have a problem that doesn't seem to easily resolve or be solved, this is what I want you to know, is that even though it's not immediately taken care of, he can give you wisdom and discernment in order to figure it out. There are things that God provides. And here's the amazing thing. When we pray both the prevention and the provision part, then no matter what happens in life, our worry begins to go away. In fact, the result is we experience his peace. So even if I'm going through a difficult challenge and I'm going to have to carry this for a while, I can trust God is going to give me the strength I need to get through this. That's what we receive is peace. Last prayer killer that we can neutralize, and that is guilt. Guilt. There are some things we do not want other people to know about us. We have motives that are embarrassing. We have temptations that we struggle with. We have weaknesses that can be paralyzing. And we worry that if anybody else found out about that, they would 
they would reject us or at least create distance from us. And by the way, if you think you don't have any weaknesses or any temptations, I can help you out. I can. I would suggest that maybe pride, arrogance, judgmentalism, and self-righteousness might be your struggle. And the good news is you can pray about that too. The goal of true spirituality is not to get better at hiding and pretending about our secret struggles. The goal of true spirituality is to get better at disclosing our true spiritual struggles. If we think if we, think we just need to hide it better, we can't get better. This is what it says in Psalm 32, a great passage of Scripture. It says, when I kept silent, my bones, what's the next two words? Wasted away. They wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, from day and night your hand was heavy on me and my strength was, what's the next word? Sapped, as in the heat of summer. This is what he says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Unconfessed sin makes us feel fragile and joyless and weak. Unconfessed sin makes us feel fragile and joyless and weak. And here's the challenge. A lot of times in conversations with people when it comes to our unconfessed sins or even our conversations with God, we don't just confess it. What we want to be told is that what we did wasn't that bad. Or we want to be told it didn't matter. Or we want to be told you were right. But what we need to be told is you are forgiven. That's the difference. That's what we need to be told. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So how do you take a guilt break? Well, first of all, admit everything that makes you feel guilty. Just get it out there to God. You can't say this to everybody. Not everybody's a safe person to talk to. When I was raising our children, I used to tell them a little illustration like this. I would say, if... A stranger came to the door, would you let them in? And if they said yes, we'd have another whole conversation. I said, but when people come into your lives, sometimes you know they're not safe and you have to keep the door closed. Sometimes you're not sure, you haven't learned enough about them yet. So you keep the door partially opened, but partially closed, so you can close it. And then when you know them and you trust their heart, you can open the door of your life completely to them. Uh, sometimes we just want to kind of vent on other people. And that doesn't always help, but you can always talk to God. He is always safe. You can have the door of your heart completely open to him. So admit everything that makes you feel guilty, and then don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. And don't blame others. There is nothing to learn if you're already right. But hear this. Unconfessed sin becomes repetitive sin. It doesn't matter how bad you feel about it. It will happen again if we do not bring this before God. The result is freedom. You just feel free. Hurry, worry, guilt. These are our biggest prayer killers in life. But in the midst of all of it, you can neutralize it by taking a little mini vacation, not a spiritual obligation, but a little mini vacation. You can take a prayer break even before you begin your day. You can sit there at the counter or the table with a cup of coffee and just focus on the love of God and focus on the gifts of God and begin to say thank you to God. And then anything that makes you anxious or worry throughout the course of the day, you can just convert that to a prayer right there. Or anything that you feel guilty about in the course of the day, you can convert that to prayer right there. And it's absolutely amazing how God uses those little mini breaks to release exactly what we need. He allows us to feel rested. He allows us to feel his peace. And he allows us to experience freedom. And that comes when we're willing to take those little mini vacations in prayer. Let's bow our heads this morning.
if you were to actually put this into practice, how many prayers might you pray in a day? Hmm, depends on the day. There are some days we worry more than others. There are some days we feel more guilty than others. There are some days we feel more hurried and stressful than others. But this is what I can tell you. You can talk to God about all of it. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. So Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us with this. Uh, our lives are so busy, and we can wear ourselves out just trying to keep up. And there are so many things that we're concerned about. It makes us anxious, and, and we become afraid of. And I just ask that you would help us convert those fears and those worries into prayer, that we'd actually ask you not just to keep things from happening, but to release things to us in the midst of those happenings that will enable us to walk through these valleys. And I also ask that for the guilt, the shame, those feelings of embarrassment that we carry around, that maybe nobody else can read on our face, you see in our heart, it's a kind of prison that we've grown weary of living in. Would you help us find the courage to disclose even the darkest things? Because you really are gentle, and you really are humble, and you really are kind, and you don't push us away. You offer this amazing thing called forgiveness, and it is so freeing that it changes us forever. Help us do this each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand with me this morning.